Thank you. Welcome back. So this is the third and last lecture uh, of this topic. Um, so I'll be talking about gauging symmetry protected topological states and also gauging um, just some simple states with so-called subsystem symmetry in order to get what we now call fracton order. Okay. Not, not exactly topological order. Uh, I would prefer to not call it exactly as topological order, just as fracton order. Um, but I'll, I'll explain what I'm talking about with very explicit examples. Okay, so, um, but before that, I think I need to clarify something because I got a lot of questions yesterday regarding the idea of spontaneous symmetry breaking. Okay, and I, 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 uh, I totally agree that this is very, it's a very important notion, but it's also a very confusing uh, notion. Okay, so let me say something before we actually get to talk about the main subject of today. Spontaneous symmetry breaking. Okay. Um, so first let's deal with global symmetry. Okay, so for example, like in the icing model we had yesterday, where the coupling is sigma x, sigma x, i, j. The whole system has a z2 symmetry, which is the tensor product of all the, all the sigma z, right? Um, so what does it mean to, be, to spontaneously break the symmetry? Well, the, the usual explanation is that if you try to find the ground state of this Hamiltonian, you will find there are two ground states. One of them is all the spin pointing in the plus x direction, and the other is all the spin points in the minus x direction. Right. And, uh, and, and usually we will just say that uh, because each ground state breaks the symmetry, and actually each of them map to the other, under the symmetry transformation, so we'll say it's symmetry breaking. Okay. And this is, this is a statement which is okay if you really understand what's going on, but not okay if, um, if, if this is used as a, a complete justification for symmetry breaking because we're dealing with a quantum system. If we're dealing with a classical system, we can talk about the number of ground states. But as a quantum system, we can only talk about the dimension of the ground space, meaning that the, the whole ground space is now actually two-dimensional, and any superposition of these two states are ground states of the Hamiltonian. Right. And in particular, we can make superposition Of these two states, we can just do an equal wave superposition or we can sum them up with a minus sign. And we would end up with some wave function which actually are invariant under the global symmetry transformation. Right. If you apply the Z2 symmetry onto either of these two states, uh, you either, it either does nothing or it adds a minus sign to the whole wave function. Okay. So then, we can just as well choose these two states to, to be the basic states of our ground space. Then in what sense is the system symmetry breaking, right? Now both of these states, they are uh, well-defined eigenstates of the symmetry transformation. Okay. But of course, spontaneous symmetry breaking is still a legitimate idea even though we're doing quantum mechanics. And the reason is that, well, the reason very simply stated is that in a many-body system, we would prefer to think about states like this, but not states like this. Right? What's wrong with states like this? States like this are very big superposition of totally different wave functions. So these, these two wave functions, where the spins either point in the plus direction or in the minus direction, they are like two universes. And when we make a bigger superposition of them, it's like saying that we want the Schrodinger's cat to be both alive and dead. We know that macroscopically, it's usually not very stable to have these kind of macroscopic 
superposition, and usually, as long as you some, have some perturbation in the system, uh, the, the, the big um, superposition will decay into either one of them. But, but that's, um, uh, but let's try to make the statement more precise. Okay, what do we mean when we say we like these kind of states but not these kind of states? Because we know that wave function can always be written as superposition of something, right? Even though it's a tensor product space, we can write it as a superposition of something. So what is the criteria for saying that which wave function we want to look at when we try to determine whether the system is undergoing spontaneous symmetry breaking? The criteria here is correlation, correlation function. Okay. So this is, a, this is a product state. And for product state, if you calculate something called the connected correlation function, it's going to be zero. Connected correlation function, can you see down here? You should move up there. Connected correlation function is the expectation value of two operator, O1, O2, minus the expectation value of O1 times the expectation value of O2. Usually what we do is that we put O1 here and O2 there and, and separate them by some distance and then we try to make the distance become larger and larger and see how this, uh, how this correlation function changes with distance. And then using this kind of function, we can distinguish these kind of states from this kind of states because you can see that with some kind of, with some choice of O1 and O2, these two big superpositions, they can actually have very long range correlation. While for these product states, product states can never have uh, uh, long range correlation. Right? For product states, as long as you have two non-overlapping um, operators, the connected correlation function is exactly going to be zero. Okay. And more generically, <clears throat> more gen generically, we might have a Hamiltonian that's not exactly solvable, and we're going to have some wave function, ground state wave function, that's not exactly tensor product states. But then we can still look at the connected correlation function. We can require that the basis state we look at to be short, short range correlated, meaning that the correlation function decays with distance in an exponential way. Okay. And that is when we say, okay, this is the wave function we want to look at. Of course, product states are, spe are the limiting cases where the, the correlation function just go to zero uh, beyond certain finite distance. Okay. But usually, there's a tail of decay, uh, but the, t the decaying tail is very fast. It goes exponentially uh, with distance. So the way to tell whether there's spontaneous symmetry breaking is to, um, the first way is to look at short range correlated ground state and see if it breaks symmetry. So when we require short range correlation, these kind of big superpositions, they're not allowed. We can only have these kind of wave function. And they, we find that each of them has to spontaneously break symmetry. Okay. And the other <coughs> way to do it, without saying that we prefer certain, eigen, uh, certain ground states more than others, is to use, um, use the idea of an order parameter. An order parameter is something that should have a zero expectation value if symmetry is not broken. Okay, so this is something that has a non-zero symmetry charge, for example. In this case, usually the kind of order parameter we can choose is the operator like sigma x, which is odd under symmetry. Right? If the whole system is symmetric, if, if nothing's being broken, then the expectation value of that operator is going to be uh, zero. Okay. So we can either do like sigma x or we can do sigma y, or we can do some more complicated operators, but 
as long as it transforms non-trivially under the symmetry, then we can consider it, consider it as an uh, other parameter. So with other parameter, again, we can calculate correlation function And we can actually calculate, sorry, uh, so, so what I'm writing is, uh, and when we calculate correlation function, we can actually calculate it uh, on, uh, we, we can actually calculate on these metric states. And, um, And in a symmetry breaking situation, it's actually going to give um, a very long tail. Okay. Uh, for example, we, we can calculate on this wave function, or can, we can calculate on this wave function, and you see that in both cases, there's going to be a non-zero expectation value for this correlation function, even when we take the distance between r and r prime to be very big. So we can do either one, okay? But they both involve, um, in general, calculation of some correlation function and taking the distance to infinity, and then see in a thermodynamic limit whether there's real spontaneous symmetry breaking going on or not, okay? So this is, uh, uh, again, emphasizing that spontaneous symmetry breaking is a notion that's only valid in the thermodynamic limit. And if, you're, if you have a finite set system, it's actually quite con not, not very easy to tell if the system is spontaneous symmetry breaking or not. For example, when we do numerical calculations, if we take a Hamiltonian like that, plus B sigma Z, um, and, and do numerics, right? And we, we try to look for the ground state and try to tell if the system is spontaneous symmetry breaking. What will happen in a finite system, if you look for the ground state, the ground state is always going to be something like this, not exactly like this, because there's a non-zero B, but it's going to be something like this, which is actually invariant under the symmetry. Because as long, there's, as, long as there's uh, some tunneling between the, the two sectors, in a finite size system, this, this state is going to have lower energy than this state, okay? So in a finite size system, you do numerics, you're always going to see there's a unique ground state, and the unique ground state satisfy the symmetry. And the only way to know whether the system is actually spontaneous symmetry breaking or not is to take the system size larger and larger, and then do either one of those things. And only when the system size is large enough so that you can see the trend of a correlation function, of all the parameter, so on and so forth, can you tell whether um, uh, this is actually, um, uh, this is, uh, whether symmetry breaking is actually happening. Okay. okay, so this is regarding global symmetry. Any questions? Yes. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, some local operator which transform non-trivially under symmetry, yeah, which are usually like charged under symmetry. Okay, yes. Yes. Yeah, exponential. Yeah, but, but there are different ways of being slower. <laughs> and there are polynomially slower, po polynomial decaying correlation function, or it can be just not decaying at all. It's going to infinity. And so in, in, the, in that case, the superposition between plus state and minus state, that's a infinite um, uh, length, cor infinite correlation length. But, um, 
Uh, no, 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 sorry. And that, what I'm what trying to say is that the, the correlation lens actually doesn't, the correlation function doesn't, doesn't decay. But if we have a critical wave function, like a, a gapless wave function, that's going to have a, usually a polynomial decaying wave function. Were there some other questions here? Oh, yeah. Sorry? No, they're just local. And O1, O2, so this, this statement is that for any O1, O2, we want this to be short range entangled, uh, short range correlated, sorry. Now we require that we are looking at a ground state which is short range correlated for any O1 and O2. Okay, um, so, so this is for global symmetry, okay. And then uh, yesterday, because we were talking about gauging, uh, uh, no, someone was asking what, what is this um, idea of spontaneous symmetry breaking of gauge symmetry? Or actually, uh, what is this idea of there's no spontaneous symmetry breaking of gauge symmetry, right? So, um, so there's actually, uh, I found a paper uh, which says, um, this is by Alice Hoare, and the paper is about impossibility of spontaneous spontaneously breaking local symmetries. So I can give you the reference. The 1975 paper. And the title is just Impossibility of Spontaneously Breaking Local Symmetries. Okay. So, so the, the story was that uh, people were look, studying some some model with gauge symmetry, and the kind of gauge symmetry that we have seen uh, in the previous lectures, where you have some, some local action of symmetry, and then you have independent symmetry operators everywhere. And uh, one of the confusion at the time was whether the ground state wave function can develop non-zero expectation value for some other parameter, meaning that the, uh, an operator, which is actually the, the vector potential, um, whether uh, the ground state wave function can have a non-zero expectation value for the vector potential. Okay, and the author of this paper is trying to say that's not possible. And um, if you are, if you get the true ground state, the true ground state is always going to have um, a, a zero expectation value. That, that symmetry is not broken. Uh, in the ground state, in a, in a, at least in a spontaneous way. Okay. If you explicitly break the gauge symmetry, and that's what was called in this paper called gauge fixing. If you gauge fix, meaning that you spontaneously, uh, sorry, you explicitly add term to the Hamiltonian which breaks the gauge symmetry, then of course the symmetry is already broken. There's nothing against having a non-zero expectation value of some um, other parameter in the ground state. But Unless you do that, then that's not going to happen. Okay, and um, and having explained um, spontaneous symmetry breaking for global symmetry, I think it should be straightforward to at least intuitively to understand why it cannot happen for local symmetry. Right, because the the fact that spontaneous global symmetry can be spontaneously broken is tightly related to the, to the fact that we have different ground states, they're globally different, and the way to connect one to the other is by applying this global operation of flipping all the spins, which is a, a highly uh, non-trivial thing to do. And spontaneous symmetry breaking only happens in the thermodynamic limit, right? Only when the system size is very, very large, only when flipping from one ground state to the other is a very hard thing to do, do we have real spontaneous symmetry breaking? Imagine what would happen for a local symmetry. If you locally break the symmetry, you can imagine that you do something locally to flip the, the system around. Well, originally, for example, you have a spin pointing in the plus direction. You just flip it to, um, in, to be in the minus direction, and you, you can make a superposition between these two configurations, which are different in a local way then you restore the symmetry, right? So, so this kind of local symmetry breaking can always be restored using some local perturbation to the system. And that is exactly why 
uh, local symmetry can cannot be spontaneously broken. Right? Spontaneous symmetry breaking is a notion that only applies when you have very, very big uh, symmetry operators which map the system in a global way. Okay. So actually, if you, um, of course, this is all related to the, to the, to the Higgs model that we talk about. Uh, remember that uh, <coughs> we started from the, the symmetry breaking phase of the Ising model, and we gauged it. We gauged it by changing, by, by inserting some tau x into the Ising coupling term, adding some Ploquet term, and then also enforcing, uh, by, by, and then also adding the, the gauge symmetry term into the Hamiltonian, which is uh, sigma z tau z tau z tau z tau z. Okay. Okay, so you can ask, you can actually just play with this very, very simple toy model and see what happens in terms of symmetry breaking. Right? For this model, we know that it has spontaneous symmetry breaking, that um, there are two-fold degeneracy in the ground states and uh, one map to the other under the symmetry transformation. For this Hamiltonian, if you remember, we explicitly argued that there's a unique ground state. There's a unique ground state and all the other excited states have a gap away from the ground state meaning that there's no breaking of symmetry. Okay. So this Hamiltonian, of course, it still has the global symmetry. It still is invariant under the global symmetry of the Ising model. But the spontaneous symmetry is gone. The spontaneous symmetry breaking is gone. It is somehow absorbed into the fluctuation of the gauge field. And once the gauge field is here, the gauge field interacts with, with the, 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 the spontaneous symmetry breaking state, with the condensate and then get rid of it. So no spontaneous symmetry breaking for global symmetry, no spontaneous symmetry breaking for local symmetry, no symmetry breaking at all for this Hamiltonian, and there's a unique ground state. So this is somewhat related to uh, the, the usual Higgs mechanism that we were talking, that we usually talk about uh, when we say that, uh, for example, in, uh, uh, in um, in a superconductor, uh, the charge conservation symmetry is breaking down to Z2. So usually when a, a U1 symmetry, a continuum symmetry is breaking, is broken down to some discrete symmetry, there will be ghost stone modes. Right? There will be some, some uh, gapless modes um, um, because of the symmetry breaking of a continuous symmetry. But once you couple it to a gauge field, and because of the coupling, the ghost stone mode is gone. And the, 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 the gauge field comes in and fluctuates uh, together with the condensate. Not only that the ghost mode is gone, the photon mode of the gauge field is gone, and that's because they combine together and both of them disappear, and the whole system becomes gapped. Okay. Of course, that is a more advanced version of the, of the Higgs mechanism. Um, this is a very toy model uh, of what is happening. In our, in our case, there's no continuum symmetry, there are no gapless modes, um, but the physics is actually uh, very similar. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Spend a lot of time on this. Uh, so uh, so yes. Uh, uh, HG has a uh, unique ground state. Yes. That, uh, sorry, I just. Uh, no. Uh, no. HG does not. HG has unique ground state on any manifold. So. Uh, the one that does have ground state degeneracy is which when we uh, gauge the symmetric limit of the Ising model, yeah, which we end up with toric code. Okay, so uh, let's get to the topic of today about gauging so-called symmetry protected topological states and end up with something called uh, twisted gauge theory. Okay, you might not heard either of them, um, but no worries, I'll, I'll give you a very, very explicit example 
about what I'm uh, for, for, for this topic. And uh, there's actually a very nice reference uh, for this part of discussion and for some other part of discussion, so I'll just write them down. So this is a paper by Michael Levin and Zheng Cheng Gu in 2012, um, PRB. And the title is Braiding Statistics Approach to Symmetry Breaking, uh, so, uh, to, to Symmetry Protected Topological States. And I highly recommend that you re read this paper because it's very nicely written and a lot of details are explained, uh, are containing this paper. And another one I, maybe you will find useful is Electronode um, by Kitaev and Chris Lauman back in 2009. And this was never published. It's only on archive. Archive number I'm writing down here. And this paper is called Topological Faces and Quantum Computation. Uh, this paper contains a, a, a very a detailed explanation of Tauric code, of the excitation of Tauric code, and uh, more generally about topological phases. And in particular, it, it talks about the phase diagram of Tauric code, which I, I, I don't have much time to talk about in this lecture, but I got a lot of questions about it. So if you want to learn about the phase diagram, about the Higgs transition, about the, uh, the, the the confinement transition of Torico, you can uh, look at this paper. Okay. Of course, this, uh, this lecture note actually contains a lot of other useful materials, like the discussion of Marana chain, of the uh, two-dimensional uh, hexagonal lattice model, uh, which are all very useful. Okay, so for the discussion of uh, symmetry protect topological states and gauging them, this is the paper. The first one is the paper that talk talks about them. Okay, so I took the pain to draw a triangular lattice. This is as good as I can do. Um, uh, somehow I cannot use um, square lattice anymore. I'll, I'll tell you why in a little bit. But the fundamental physics is still very similar. We're going to have matter field living on, at the vertices of the triangular lattice, and we're going to have gauge field living on the links. Okay. So the green dots are the matter fields, the sigma degrees of freedom, and we're going to have the tau, the gauge field living on uh, the edges, okay? okay? So I'm actually uh, going to talk about two different Hamiltonians, two different systems in parallel, just for comparison. The first one is well, the first one is the one we have been talking about the whole time, the symmetric phase of the Ising model. So the Hamiltonian is simply sigma z i summed over i. Maybe I should write v. Okay, let me write v. Sigma z v at the vertex and summed over the vertex. This is the symmetric limit of the Ising model. The second Hamiltonian looks very similar, but with a little bit twist added to it. There's still a sigma z part, uh, but then it's multiplied with some phase factor. Okay. And the phase factor, first let me write it down. It's one minus sigma x W sigma x W prime over two multiplied over triangles V W W prime. Okay. So if this is V, this green dot is V, then we find the triangle which contains V and two other vertices, one is called W the other is called W prime, okay? So there are two extra matter fields at the W and W prime points.
And the phase factor that we multiply onto the sigma z is for each of such triangles. Okay. So there are, there are six triangles like this. Right? So v is involved in six triangles. And uh, for each of the triangle, we add a phase factor like that. And the phase factor is related, related to uh, the difference between sigma x and uh, for w and sigma x for w prime. If they're the same, there are no phase factor. If they're opposite in the x direction, there will be a phase factor of i. And that's it. Okay. Is, is, uh, is the notation clear? Yeah? It's, okay. it's complicated. Okay. The Hamiltonian now involves um, seven, seven matter field degrees of freedom at the same time. Right? It looks terrible. And um, I don't think without, any, without insight, anybody would be able to solve the Hamiltonian. Um, um, but the, the thing is that um, we, we do have insight coming from somewhere, such that we know that there's, um, this is, again, exactly solvable Hamiltonian, meaning that all the Hamiltonian terms commute. So let me label this one as As, uh, as d v, and you can explicitly check that d v and d v prime commute with each other. Amazingly, <laughs> even though they look so ugly, they still commute with each other so that you can, they, there's a unique ground state to uh, all these Hamiltonian terms. And the second reason why we're talking um, H0 and H1 together is that they're both symmetric under the global Z2 symmetry, right? But obviously, the, the first one is symmetric, and the second one is also symmetric because it involves the product of two sigma x at the same time. So if you apply the symmetry, this term doesn't change, this term doesn't change, the Hamiltonian is totally uh, invariant. So these two Hamiltonian, they're invariant on a global symmetry, and we can ask, does the ground state spontaneously break the symmetry? So for the first one, it does not. For the second one, it does not either. Okay. So I'm actually going to tell you what the ground state wave function is like. But the thing is, these two Hamiltonian both have unique ground state, which doesn't spontaneously break the global symmetry. However, these two ground state wave functions are very, very different, and there's no way to map from one to the other in a way such that we preserve the global symmetry. Okay. So when the global symmetry is preserved, these two Hamiltonian actually belong to different phases. This is what we call the symmetry-protected topological phase, that is, the H0 is in the symmetry protected trivial phase, and the second one is in a non trivial symmetry protected topological phase. Of course, um, this, this might sound um, not very familiar, but I'm sure that you probably have all heard about topological insulator. Okay. How many of you have heard about topological insulator? Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> topological insulator is exactly a symmetry protected topological phase in fermion system with charge conservation and time reversal symmetry. The different de system of degree of freedom, the different set of symmetry, here it's the unitary Z2 symmetry. In topological insulator case, it's time reversal and charge conservation symmetry. But the idea is the same. Now, as long as you keep the symmetry, there's no way to, to deform these non-trivial symmetry protected topological states to the trivial one. And in the topological insulator case, you can never deform a topological insulator into a, a, a atomic limit of an insulator, um, a mod insulator, for example, while preserving uh, the whole symmetry of the system. All right. OK, so, so let me tell you what the ground state wave function looks like. Okay, it's actually not that terrible. 
Um, so let's first think about what the ground state wave function looks like for the uh, for H zero. H zero is simple enough, and uh, we can immediately write down what the ground state wave function is. Ground state wave function is a product state. All the spins are polarized in uh, the z direction. Right? So we have a tensor product between all the zero state. Okay. Um, so this is simple enough, but it's too simple. We want to write it in a more complicated way. Okay. Let's expand it in the basis of plus minus states of the eigenstates of sigma x. Because we know that the zero state can be written as the superposition of plus and minus. I'm, I'm not keeping track of normalization. So we can, we can write it like that. And then we expand everything. So we get a configuration like all plus, and we get a configuration where we have all plus but one minus. And we have a configuration where we just have plus minus, plus plus minus. And we have a superposition of all possible spin configuration in the x direction. Yes, yes. Minus is the eigenvalue of the Yes, eigenstates. Yes, sorry. Yeah, I should make that clear. So sigma z acting on 0 is 0. Sigma z acting on 1 is minus 1. And sigma x acting on plus is plus. Sigma x acting on minus is minus a minus. Okay, that's my notation. Um, so, so this gives us another way to interpret the symmetric wave function of H0, right? Because if we only look at one term, this is a, this is a configuration that breaks the symmetry, right? Usually we, we call it a, a domain configuration because it, it, it's something like a magnetic domain that breaks the, the symmetry of the system. And, um, and we have a domain configuration where all the spins are plus, and we have domain configuration where all the spins are minus, and now we also have domain configuration of all kinds, right? So the symmetric wave function is actually a superposition over all domain configurations. Um, so we can start from one domain configuration, allow the spin to, to fluctuate, and then we make a superposition of all possible ways the spin can fluctuate, and in the end, the fluctuation will restore the symmetry and get us back to uh, the symmetric ground state. Okay. So that's the way we can interpret the symmetric ground state as a way starting from the symmetry breaking uh, ground state. Of course, this is just making the story too complicated, right? We had a product state. We want to write it in an expansion and, and uh, um, uh, as a superposition of exponentially many terms. But why do we want to do that? And the reason we want to do that is uh, now we would have a very easy way to write the wave function of H1. So this is a sum over all domain configuration. It turns out, I won't be able to show you, I'll just claim that the ground state wave function of psi 1 can also be written as the superposition of all domain configurations. With a twist. And the twist is the phase factor of minus 1 to the number of domain walls. Okay. 
Okay, what is the domain wall? Well, if all the spins are in the plus direction, there's no domain wall, right? If all the spins are in the plus direction, but this one is in the minus state, if only this spin is in a different state than all the others, then there will be a domain wall around it, right? You can draw a domain wall between this particular state, between this particular spin and all the others in the system. Okay. And um, if, we, um, if we have another spin, which is in the minus one state over here, then we have another domain wall. Okay, so we can count the number of domain walls. If we only have this, we have one domain wall. If we also have this, we have two domain wall. And the coefficient in front of the configuration is minus one to the number of domain walls, so we care about the, the parity of the number of domain walls. And of course, here I'm only drawing very, very small domain wall. We can have bigger domain wall. We can have a whole patch of spins in the plus direction while the others are in the minus direction. So we have a bigger domain wall uh, like that. We can always count. Yes. Uh, it can be odd. For example, if only this dot is plus and all the other spins are minus, then there's only one loop of domain wall, right? Then that means it's, uh, it's one. And that kind of state gets a minus sign. What, sorry? Yeah, we count the domain number of loops for the domain wall. Yes, yeah, so, so it's domain walls. So you count the, how many loop of walls there are in the configuration, yes. Sorry? And only loop type because, because this is, oh, we're talking about closed system, uh, domain walls have to be closed. Okay. And, and, and now I can explain why I have to take the pain to draw the uh, triangular lattice, not a square lattice, because in a square lattice, we might have domain wall configuration that looks like this. We have two square and that touch each other, right? And then there can be ambiguity whether this is two, there, there are two domain walls or whether there are just one domain wall because it depends on the detail at the crossing whether the crossing is like this or whether the crossing is like this, right? So this will give you different solutions so we'll, we'll try to avoid uh, a square lattice but rather go to uh, triangular lattice, and the nice thing about triangular lattice is that the domain wall live on the dual lattice of hexagonal lattice. And hexagonal is a trivalent lattice, meaning that you always only have three strings, uh, three, three, three links going into each other. Right? So there will not be a, a confusion as to whether the, they're crossing or not, or uh, what, whether they go this way or that way very important that we do this. But of course, um, it's not like we can no longer talk about square lattice anymore. If we do want to talk about square lattice, we need to just be very careful and define what happens at the crossing. You can just take the square lattice and, and make it look like that at each vertex and just split the vertices into trivalent and then we are fine. Okay, uh, so, so, so that's, that's a two-way function. One is just uh, the superposition, equal weight superposition of all the domain configurations, and the other is the equal weight superposition of all the domain configurations up to a phase factor depending on the even and oddness of the number of domain wall. Okay. okay. And you can see that Z2 symmetry is indeed preserved. Okay. Because uh, in, in this case, of course, it's easy to see why Z2 symmetry is preserved because Z2 symmetry flips all the domains, right? It flips all the spins. So it maps from one configuration to another configuration, which is like all minus. 
it always maps between different configurations which are involved in this big superposition, so the big superposition doesn't change. On the other hand, for this psi one, it is also invariant under um, the Z2 symmetry action because the Z2 symmetry action maps between different domain configuration, but for those two domain configuration, they have the same domain wall. Right? It doesn't matter whether the inside is plus or whether the outside, uh, sorry, whether the inside is plus or minus. As long as inside and outside are different, you have the same domain wall configuration. So Z2 symmetry action doesn't change the number of domain walls and doesn't change the plus minus sign in front of the superposition. So the total wave function is still invariant uh, under the global symmetry, meaning that there's no spontaneous symmetry breaking uh, in the system. Okay, um, nice. So this is, uh, this is saying that uh, we have two different Hamiltonian invariant on a global symmetry, and they each have uh, unique symmetric ground states. Now let's try to gauge them. Okay, so we're just doing the same thing we have been doing in the past two lectures. We have some matter field at the vertices, and if we try to gauge the global symmetry, the first thing we want to do is to put in some gauge field. And we know that we want the gauge field to live on the edges. So we add a gauge degree of freedom tau, and tau again is a spin one half, it's so a qubit degree of freedom with operator tau x and tau z, and we add one per each edge uh, in the system. Okay, so. So I'm sure you can just already write down the gauge Hamiltonian for h0 in a very straightforward way, right? We have been talking about that all the time. So to gauge H0, the first thing we need to do, well, first thing we need to do is to talk about gauge symmetry. What is the local symmetry action that we want to preserve while we promote the Hamiltonian into a gauge version? It will be the same as what we have been doing all the time, except that we are doing it on the triangular lattice, so there will be six gauge fields associated with a single matter field. So there will be a sigma z and then six tau z. Tau z, tau z, tau z. So it's a bigger term, but it's not any more complicated. It's just a local symmetry action involving both matter field and gauge field. So now we want to write the Hamiltonian in a way such that it is invariant under this global symmetry. Uh, sorry, under this local symmetry. Um, but for H0, we don't need to do anything, right? Because each of the terms is already gauge symmetric. We just keep them there. And then we remember that we need to add some dynamics to the gauge field because otherwise the degeneracy is too big. So we add. Uh, the BP terms. And the only non-trivial thing here is that the BPs, the plaquettes, they are triangles. They're not squares anymore. And we just, for each of the triangle, we add a term like tau x, tau x, tau x. Okay. And uh, finally, we can we, we can put the, the gauge symmetry term as a Hamiltonian term into the gauge Hamiltonian, just saying that we consider gauge, gauge symmetry as some dynamical constraint, but not as a hard constraint on the Hilbert space. This will not change anything for the ground state or for the low energy dynamics, which are the things uh, that we care about. So we just put sigma z and all the tau z tensor product of them into the Hamiltonian. Okay, so I will not write, write that in detail. 
Okay, so this is for H0. Now about for H1. Now we do the same exercise, right? For H1, we take this big ugly term and try to make it gauge invariant. It's actually not that bad because this part is already gauge invariant. We just need to make this part gauge invariant, but this part is just, it, 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 even though it's complicated, it only involves this icing coupling term, and we know how to make icing coupling term gauge symmetric, right? We just insert a tau x uh, in the middle. So we simply have this thing, and then a product over the triangles that involves v, i to the one minus sigma x w tau x w w prime sigma x w prime and divided over two. So these, these triangles are the, the ones that includes v. And we're done, right? So the first term, we make a gauge symmetric just, just like that. And then we just copy whatever we did upstairs. We have the flux term, the Plaquet term, and then uh, the gauge symmetry term. And that's it. So we get two different Hamiltonians with the same gauge symmetry, okay? Just the matter field is doing something different. So remember, uh, we, we summarize what we learned from gauging uh, the symmetric phase of the icing model the other day, and we said a few things. Right? First of all, um, the gauge charge comes from the symmetry charge. Right? So, well, in both model, in both cases, there are spin models and the symmetry is this, this Z2 symmetry, and a symmetry charge can be simply generated by applying a sigma x, by flipping a spin, right? So, so this is telling us that in both cases, no fermions are involved, there are no fermions at all, so we would expect the symmetry charge to simply be a bosonic symmetry charge. So we should, so for either, either Hamiltonian, if we find them to be topological, we should find that they have one species of quality particle which is bosonic, which corresponds to uh, the, uh, the original uh, symmetry charge. And of course, we expect it to satisfy this kind of fusion rule that two symmetry charge should fuse to something not fractional because this is a Z2 charge, so there's only an even oddness to the symmetry charge. Okay, and secondly, we know that this is Z2 symmetry, so we should have Z2 charge braiding around the Z2 flux, giving rise to a phase factor of, of what? We're giving rise to a phase factor of? Of pi, yes. And it can only be pi because this is a Z2 symmetry, right? We don't have other options. So this is the Hanoff Baum effect between E and M, if you have an E here, oh sorry, if you have an M here and you bring an E around it, that's going to generate a phase factor of minus one or E to the I pi. So these things are all fixed. Okay. And the only thing that can be different is in terms of the magnetic flux, in terms of M. So M is the flux of the Z2 um, symmetry, okay? Meaning that if the charge hops around, whether it sees a zero flux or a pi flux. But a, a zero flux and pi flux, the only thing that the, 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 <coughs> the charge can see. So this flux for the Z2 symmetry, again, fuels itself into a non-fractional thing. Right, because two pi is equivalent to zero. So if you have a pi flux, fuse it with a pi flux, you get back to having nothing. So we do expect this. 
And then what's left for the M particle to be different in these two models is their topological spin. So M0, which is the flux in the first model, well, now when we know, because this is exactly the model that we studied the other day, except that it is now on a triangular lattice. Right? And we can just safely remove uh, on the matter field because we can just consider uh, the states which are the ground state of this term. And then we can get rid of the matter field in the center of uh, this, the, the gauge symmetry term. And then we have a, uh, a pure um, a gauge theory without a matter field, and that's exactly the toric code Hamiltonian uh, on the triangular lattice. There's nothing more to it. And it, it will have the same universal property. It will have the same uh, ground state degeneracy. It will have the same quasi-particle species and their statistics. And, and they just follow exactly from our discussion the other day. And actually, even though we started our discussion the other day on the square lattice, as we moved on, I forgot about the lattice. Remember, I drew the picture without specifying which kind of lattice I was on. It, just because for the Tory code, actually, we don't really care for all the universal properties. So even though we move on to the triangular lattice, all the properties that we talked about the other day still applies. Okay. So the M flux quasi-particle is bosonic um, for H0. But the flux in the second case turns out to be semionic, meaning that it has a topological spin of pi over two, meaning that if you do a, pi, a figure of eight for the string operator, you get a phase factor of i. Okay. okay, I can roughly sketch how this works. I won't be able to do the algebra very carefully, if you want, do want to check the algebra, uh, go to this paper, it contains all the details, and you can follow through, you can see how things work. But right now, I'm just going to roughly sketch, okay, uh, why um, what we expect should actually happen for these two particular models. Okay, so, um, well, how do we find the statistics of the quasi-particles? How, how, how can we determine the statistics of the quasi-particles? The way we can determine that is by, well, drawing the string operator, right? And if you, we do, remember if we do a figure of eight, we get the cell statistics. And if we, are, um, if we do this kind of configuration and we're doing different order, their commutation relation will give us the braiding statistics. So the key becomes finding the string operator for uh, the different species of quasi-particles. And what is string operator? String operator is an operator that creates excitations at the two ends, and only at the two ends. Okay. So we need to find some operator that, as it passes through the ground state, it doesn't create excitation in the middle. It only creates excitation at the end. Okay. Uh, so let, let's see how that works for Tori code, for, for H0. For H0, well, first of all, we can create flux excitation. We can create one flux here and one flux here. Right. The fluxes, they live in the triangles. So let's try to create a flux excitation. The flux excitation, uh, they're just uh, applying sigma z to this line. Sorry, tau z. Tau z, tau z, tau z, to all the edges that cut through uh, the blue line. Right. So, Doing that, we anti-commute with only the triangle plaquette operator here and the triangle plaquette operator there. And um, 
and that, that is a string operator, right? Because it only creates excitations at the end. And this corresponds to the string operator of M0. Okay. And then how do we create charge excitations? Well, charge excitations are created if we hop charges using the icing coupling from one point to the other. So one charge is here. Let's say we want to create another charge here. And the way to do it is to apply sigma x and tau x, tau x, tau x, tau x, all along the way, and finally sigma x. So this is the string operator for the charge. Okay. So, so, so they look exactly the same as, as what we had in the, in the square lattice historic code. And uh, then you calculate the, uh, the self-statistics, it's one. You calculate mutual statistics, these two strings, when they cross each other, they anti-commute, giving rise to the pi statistics, the, the AB phase factor of a charge with flux, just as we expected. Okay, how about for H1? We now have H1, what changes? Okay. What has to change, what doesn't? This string operator for, um, for the charge, this is still okay. All we need to worry about is whether the middle part of the string operator would commute with all the Hamiltonian terms in the middle, right? Because the difference is that originally we have this kind of term, now we have this kind of term, right? So, so they look different, and in particular, they, they involve this kind of garbage in, in the Hamiltonian. So we need to be careful and check whether it still commutes with the string operator. And it does, because there's a, only a tau x here. And the string operator is composed of tau x. And so it just doesn't see the change in the Hamiltonian at all, right? So what the string operator does is still to anti-commute with a vertex term at the end, creating two charges, okay? So this string operator is still valid. It is still the, the string operator of the E quasi-particle, which means that all the properties which involve E itself is still valid. It still fuses itself into trivial, still has a bosonic statistics, and so forth. Um, how about the one for M? How about the blue one? The blue one involves a bunch of tau z along a line, but that's trouble, right? Because tau z would see this we we'll see this tau x in this part of the Hamiltonian, so it knows about the change in the dynamics. So that's why I say that the flux knows about what the matter field is doing. The charge is just a symmetry charge, but the flux is somehow gets involved with the dynamics of the matter field and knows the matter field is doing something non-trivial. And so, so this string operator does not work anymore because as it passes along, it also changes, raises the energy of this term. So it's not a string operator anymore. It's not just creating excitation at the end. It has to be modified. And it has to be modified in a way such that um, uh, there's some extra phase factors involved in the sigma x basis on these edges. On the edges, that's a uh, and that's neighboring this string. Okay, so it becomes, it becomes fatter, it becomes more complicated, but what happens on this edge is phase factor in tau x basis. And by properly choosing the phase factor on these edges in tau x basis, we can 
make sure that this string operator, again, can mute with all the Hamiltonian terms in the middle of the string. Okay. First, I'm not going to write down the explicit form of the phase factor. It looks complicated and not very useful if I write it down. Again, it's in this paper. But then you can see what this phase factor does or it doesn't do. For example, the commutation relation between the green line and the blue line, they're still the same. Right? Because the way we change it is by adding some phase factor in tau x spaces, which commute with all the tau x in the green string. So the commutation relation between them is still the same, which is minus one, which is exactly what it should be because we expect a pi phase factor for the Aharonov bomb effect between charge and flux. And the only way things can be different is when we do a figure of eight. For this, for this more complicated string operator, that is not going to end up being one. And it turns out it ends up being I. Okay. Meaning that it's a, it's a topological spin of I corresponding to a phase factor of pi over two. Okay. So so of course, I, I, I did a lot of hand waving here. Um, I, I can't show you the algebra in a very explicit way, but I hope you can trust me and see that this is a, a, one example where I want to show you that by gauging, we can tell the difference between different symmetric phases. Yes? The what, sorry? The M particle is not bosonic, it's semionic with a topological spin of I. A fermionic is topological spin of minus one, so semion is like half fermion. So, I think that's where the name comes from. Half or half boson, depending on how you have it. <laughs> yes? Uh, <laughs> and not everything is consistent. Here, only I is consistent. If you put some other random phase factor, it's not going to be consistent. Or it's, the wave function. Is, yeah. Yeah, I cannot say that the topological spin is just that I, but uh, something related. Something. Yeah, but, but it's only consistent in this way. Otherwise, it's not like if I put a so e to the i pi over. You cannot make there, there are no other general statement regarding other phase factors here. What? Sorry? Uh, is that such thing written in the previous? You mean other phase factors? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, no, I think they only discussed this one. Yeah. Otherwise, the Hamiltonian doesn't commute. Uh, it's not exactly solvable. It's not Z2 symmetric. And there's not much more you can talk about. Yeah. OK, uh, I think let's take a 10 minute break. And when we come back, I'll talk about the, the fractal model.
Okay, um, uh, so before we move on, so just uh, to clarify what I just said yes, uh, before the break. Um, so I wrote down these two Hamiltonian, they have symmetry protected topological order. And here I gauge them and I get some gauge theory. So um, if some of these terminology makes sense to you, then these are short range, short range entangled faces. These are long-range entangled faces. These are considered to have intrinsic topological order. These are not, these faces, they don't really have topological order. We shouldn't say that they have topological order, but they have symmetry protected topological order in the sense that if you enforce symmetry, then there are different faces. That, that's the only non-trivial meaning of the term symmetry protected topological phase, that if you enforce symmetry, these two are in different phase, okay? But they don't have the usual sense of topological order where we have ground state degeneracy on different manifolds, fractional statistics, and all that. All those things only happen after you gauge it. After you gauge it, you get some intrinsic topological order, which have, well, both of them have fourfold ground state degeneracy on the torus, four different species of quasi-particles, grading statistics, self-statistics, et cetera. And if you have ever heard of the name, uh, this is in the Tauri code phase of just normal Z2 gauge theory. This is a twisted gauge theory, and the topological order is usually called a double semion topological order. Okay. Okay. So, for the last half hour or so, I do want to tell you about something that's um, much more recent. Uh, called the fractal model. And the fractal model is something uh, that, that, that came out of nowhere. It came out of a study by quantum information people who were trying to ask the question of how do we build a quantum hard drive? Okay. So now we, we, have, we have hard drive today for classical computers. Right? But one day if we have a quantum computer, how do we build a quantum hard drive? So people spend a lot of time on that. I think that, that problem has been studied for maybe 20 years or so. Um, uh, there hasn't been a very successful answer to that question yet. So if you are an uh, aspiring graduate student, you can try to think about it, how to build a, a reliable um, quantum hard drive. Uh, but in the process, in the process of trying solving that very hard question, which hasn't been solved yet, People came up with a bunch of other models. Okay. And in, in the quantum information community, people always come up with exactly solvable models because that's mathematically clean and you don't need physical intuition <laughs> to tell what they're going to do. So they, they come up with a bunch of exactly solvable models. And even though those exactly solvable models still cannot make a good quantum memory, they caught the interest of the condensed matter community who is asking, what the hell is going on with all those models? Because all those models, they have some very weird property which look like topological order. For example, they have 
ground state degeneracy on non-trivial manifold. They have fractional, uh, fractional excitations, and the fractional excitations seem to be braiding with each other in a certain way. So they, they somehow look like topological order, but they also look more exotic than just topological order. For example, these are usually three-dimensional systems, uh, which have a ground state degeneracy that, that increase with system size. Okay, so it goes like exponential in linear system size, which is something people have never seen before in a topological order system. And also, um, there are fractional excitations that does not quite move. Okay, some of the fractional excitations just don't move. They, they're pinned at a point, and they cannot move by themselves. Sometimes they can move in pairs. Sometimes they move in a cluster, but by themselves, they cannot move. Okay. Sometimes uh, the fractional excitations only move along a line. And those are all very strange, because we've never seen that uh, in a usual topological order. In usual topological order, we know we have fractional excitation, but those fractional excitations, I can bring them wherever I want. Right? I can just draw the string operator, and wherever it terminates, I'll be able to bring this fractional excitation to that location. Uh, right, so the condensed matter community started to ask the question of what the hell is, is those models and what, 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 uh, what kind of phases do they belong to? Okay. And, and what kind of physical mechanism is responsible for generating such kind of exotic behavior? So, well, what I'm going to talk about uh, next is one way uh, to try to answer this question is that um, some of these fractal models, they can be understood in terms of gauging system, not with global symmetry, but with something called subsystem symmetry. Subsystem symmetry is a symmetry that doesn't act everywhere. It just acts somewhere. Okay. For example, if you have a three-dimensional system, we can have symmetry acting on the xy plane. We can have one symmetry generator acting per each xy plane. So here, a symmetry generator, another symmetry generator, another symmetry generator. All of them are Z2 symmetry generators, so we have lots of symmetries. And then, if we do something called gauging, very similar to what we do there, but also following a slightly different procedure, we'll be able to get some of the fractal models where the fractional excitations don't quite move. OK, so uh, let me get two examples. Okay. So one of the, uh, the most famous fractal model is called the x cubed model. The three-dimensional lattice model with qubits on the edges of a cubic lattice. I'm drawing one cube here, and uh, uh, in this cube, there will be 12 edges and hence 12 qubits. Okay. Let me call them tau. I call them tau because later they're going to become the gauge fields. Uh, the x cube model has a exactly solvable Hamiltonian, which is Kind of complicated, but not too bad. The first term is a cube term, which is a tensor product of tau x over all the edges around the cube. So there will be 12 of them. Did I miss one? I missed more than one. Okay, so 12 tau x tensor product together gives you one of the Hamiltonian terms. And we sum over all the cubes. So summing over all the cubes. And the second type of term lives at the vertices. At each vertex, we can take out a cross shape like that. And there will be four degrees of freedom associated with this cross, and we take a tensor product of all the tau z at this cross. 
But this is a three-dimensional system, so there are three ways we can take out crosses, and we do them all. So for each of the cross, we do a tensor product over 4 tau z, uh, and we sum over all the crosses. Here. OK. So this is, a, a, of course, again, a very strongly interacting spin Hamiltonian involving top body interactions, which is not nice. But the nice thing about this Hamiltonian is that, again, it is exactly solvable, meaning that all the Hamiltonian terms commute, which you can check, because you can, uh, the only non-trivial thing is whether these kind of cross term commute with the cube term, right? And you can check that whenever they overlap, they always overlap in two places. Because you have a cube, and you have one of the cross at the corner, here, then they always overlap in two places. So all of the terms commute, yes. Uh, right, so this is not the three-dimensional Tauri code. The three-dimensional Tauri code uh, is, um, it involves vertex operator, which is tau z, tau z, the tensor product of six tau z, six of them, and then the Ploquet term, which are tau x, tau x involving uh, all different Ploquets. So, well, this one might look like this one, but this one is definitely not this one. So, yeah, they, and they're, they're, they're very, very different in terms of their universal properties. OK. Um, OK, then we can ask, well, it's exactly solvable, so let's tr ask for some of its properties. If we have a system, um, an L by L by L lattice with period periodic boundary condition, what is the ground state degeneracy? We can ask that. Turns out that the log of the ground state degeneracy is uh, 3L minus 6, uh, 3L minus 6, maybe, maybe 3, sorry. I do not remember exactly what is the number, <laughs> but it's some, some final number. So, but the point is that it is something that increases with the system size, and the total ground state degeneracy actually increases exponentially with the linear size of the system, which is very fast. And secondly, we can ask, what are the fractional excitations? How can we create the fractional excitation and move them? Okay. Um, well, we can create fractional excitations and move them just by applying tau x and tau z operators. Right? That's what we did for the Tauri code. For Tauri code, we applied tau x, created a pair of flux, applied tau z, created a pair of charge, and and here, we can try to do the same thing and see what happens. So let's apply a tau x here. If we apply a tau x here, it doesn't care about the cube term, but it does care about the cross terms. So, so the cross terms are actually going to be excited but at each cross, I'm oh, sorry, at each vertex, two of the cross terms are going to be excited, right? So if I do it that way, this term and this term are going to be excited. So, so there will be a red excitation and a blue excitation. If I label this as red, this as blue, this as green. Okay, so create a, a red and blue here, and also a red and blue here. But we can keep moving, right? 
you can keep applying tau x, tau x, tau x until we have moved the red and blue to this end. So this is very similar to what we did for Tori code. We created a pair of excitation and we moved them apart. But then the difference is that we cannot make a turn. If we try to make, make a turn, for example, upward, by applying tau x here, we get into trouble because a vertical tau x is going to excite the red one and the green one. Right? It doesn't cancel the blue excitation. Well, at the same time, it cre creates an extra green excitation. So if we do that, well, the red one will follow. The red one will go up, but we will have a, a blue excitation and the green excitation sitting at the turning point. So we can keep doing that, tau x, tau x, while moving the red excitation and the green excitation upward. So this is very different from the excitation we see in a two-dimensional topological order, which can definitely make turns while still keeping their, <laughs> their, their type, right? Here, if we try to make a turn, we always deposit something at the corner, meaning that we cannot make turns. Um, these, these fractional excitations, they're, they're quasi-particles, but they can only move in a straight line. So we have three different kinds of so-called one-dimensional particle. One is a combination of red and blue. The other is the combination of green and blue. And finally, we have the combination of red and green. Three of them. Three different kind of one-dimensional excitation, one moving in the x direction, the other moving in the y direction, and finally, the third one moving in the z direction. Okay. One moving in each direction. OK? OK, so what happens if we do tau z? Um, okay. Suppose that we have a bunch of cubes just drawing one surface of the cubes and I do a tau z here. If I do a tau z to a vertical edge, this is going to violate the cube terms, right? It's going to violate four of the cube terms around this edge. So it's going to be one, one, two, three, four. There are four cube excitations surrounding this edge. Is that clear what I'm drawing? No? I can do a better job. So there are cubes. So these two cubes, they become excited, and also these two cubes. Right? All four cubes become excited if I apply uh, the tau z. So you can see that by a single tau z, I create a square of excitation. So if I, if I take a top-down view, if I take a top-down view, I would have four excitation if I do something in the middle. And then I can keep doing it. I can keep doing it and separate the excitations. But I always have four. And those four is going to sit at the corner of a rectangle. So, of course, now these three are gone, and they move apart, but they separate as the corner of a rectangle. And there's no way, there's no way that I can just move one of them. I cannot just take one of the cube excitation and move it by one step. That I cannot do. All I can do is to maybe move a pair of them along a line. And if I try to move one of them, I create three more, right? So these cube excitations by themselves, they cannot move, and they are called the fractal 
excitations. That's the, the fracton in the name. Fracton excitations. And these are the one-dimensional excitations. So that's very weird. Yes. Oh, OK. Let's see. If we try to move it, where do you want to apply the tau z operator? You can try to apply here, right? So this one gets canceled, but then we have three more excitations. So that's not called moving one excitation. It's doing, it's replacing one excitation with three. So yeah, no matter how you do it, you cannot just take one excitation and move it because these excitations they're not generated as the end of string operator. They're generated at the corner of a rectangle operator somehow. Okay, so how, how, can, how can that happen, right? How, how, how can that, um, how can something only move in one dimension and how can something only move as the corner of a rectangle? Okay. Well, there are different ways to understand this, but the way I'm, I will try to explain is of course in terms of gauging something. In the global symmetry case, we know that the, the gauge charge come from symmetry charge. Right. So the motion of the gauge charge is just the same as the symmetry charge, and symmetry charge can hop anywhere, so the gauge charge as a fractional excitation can hop anywhere. So if we try to explain this x cube as the result of gauging something, well, we probably start from some system where the, where the symmetry charge doesn't have the full possibility of motion. And that's what happens when we have system with subsystem symmetry. Okay, suppose that again we're on cubic lattice. The matter field is at each vertex. Uh, it's again a sigma spin, sigma z, sigma x, the matter field at each vertex. The on gauge Hamiltonian is very simple. It's very, very simple. It's just the transverse field at each vertex. So the simplest Hamiltonian you can think about with a product ground state. The only non-trivial thing is how we define symmetry. What kind of symmetry do we require? Well, it is invariant on the global Z2 symmetry. It is also invariant on the subsystem symmetry that only acts along a particular plane. So we're going to have symmetry on a plane, for example, where the Z, Z coordinate is fixed to be Z naught. Okay. So this is the tensor product of all sigma Z V, where V belongs to this plane. For, for example, we can take uh, this horizontal plane, which would involve one, two, three, four of the spin that I draw here, but of course it also goes infinitely. It involves all the other spins in, in this plane, right? And similarly, we can have symmetry in on x, y, on the x plane, or symmetry on the y plane. Very similar definition. Now consider what happens when I define symmetry in this way. Let, let's consider the case where I just have one symmetry. Okay, let's, let's for, for a moment, forget about these. Let's just say we have symmetry in, on a particular plane in, in the z direction. Then the symmetry charge sitting on the plane cannot hop off the plane. 
if I want to preserve symmetry, a symmetry charge can only hop within the plane. It cannot hop to another plane because the symmetry charge for that symmetry will change and thus violating the symmetry that I want to impose. Right? So if I impose one planar symmetry, one planar symmetry, then the symmetry charge would be constrained to move in a two-dimensional plane only. If it tries to hop off the plane, you violate the symmetry, that's not allowed. Well, compared to the, the case of global symmetry, if you have global symmetry, the symmetry charge is allowed to hop anywhere. It's the same universe. And uh, it hops anywhere, it preserves the symmetry. Now, what happens if we have two sets of planar symmetries? If we have one planar symmetry, another planar symmetry, and they intersect along a line. Okay. Well, suppose that some symmetry charge, like this one, is shared by this plane and also the horizontal plane. And if we try to enforce symmetry in both planes, then this charge can only move along the intersection line. Right. It has to be in both planes at the same time, and that means it can only move either to the left or to the right, but it cannot get off the line. And now finally, if we have all three planar symmetries, And if this point sits at the intersection point of all three planes, it cannot move anywhere. By itself, it cannot move anywhere because it wants to be on three planes at the same time, and there's only one point that satisfies this condition. So if we start from this model and somehow able to gauge it, we might be able to get some phenomena like that. When the symmetry charge in this case becomes the gauge charge in those fractal models, those gauge charge are going to have restricted motion. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> 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 Yeah, 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 symmetry. Here I'm talking about symmetry living on a plane, can also live on a line. Right, like in two dimension, they can live on a line. Even in three dimension, they can live on a line. Okay, uh, right, so, so now the question is how do we gauge it, right? This is, we have a different symmetry. How do we want to gauge it? Now we have a lot of symmetry generator, and, and we need to decide what's the proper procedure for gauging it. Well, the first thing you want to answer when you try to gauge something is, what is the gauge field? The gauge field is probably, again, a Z2 variable because this is a Z2 symmetry, right? But then the second question is, where do you want to put it? Where do you want to put the gauge field? So in all the previous examples, we put the gauge field on the edges. Why do we put the gauge field on the edges? Because we know that the kind of term that's not locally symmetric, which is something that we want to solve when we try to make the symmetry local, is this kind of icing term. This is the problem we need to solve. It's not these kind of these kind of terms. These kind of terms, they are locally symmetric, but we need to solve the problem of icing coupling. And because of that, we put a gauge field in between and solve the problem of icing coupling and make it gauge symmetric. So here, if we want to decide where we want to put the gauge field, we need to ask, what is the 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 the, the the counterpart here, what is the icing coupling that we can put in the system 
right now. Can we do sigma x, sigma x? Is this a coupling that's invariant under all the symmetries? Let's say we have all three symmetries. We have symmetry in x direction plane, y direction plane, and z direction planes. Okay. Is this term invariant under all symmetries? No, because if you apply symmetry in the horizontal plane, you only touch it at one point, right? The other two directions are actually fine, but if you apply symmetry in the, in the, in the z direction, it touches the, the coupling at one point, therefore uh, it's not symmetric under that z2 symmetry. So the minimum term, the minimum icing coupling term that we can add is actually a full body term involving four spins around the same square. And that always works. Okay, you can check that no matter whether you do symmetry in xy plane or yz plane or zx plane, it is always symmetric because it touches the interaction at two points. And because each of such icing coupling term is associated with one square, one plaquette, that is where we want to put the gauge field. Put the gauge field at the center of each plaquette. So for each cube, we have six tiles. One, two, three, four, five, six. We have six of them. Okay. And then the story just follows. Okay. Uh, what do we need to do? We need to take the original Hamiltonian. Try to gauge it. The matter field term is already gauge invariant, so we just copy them. Then we need to add the local gauge symmetry term. What is the local gauge symmetry term? Here, the local gauge symmetry term involves the matter field and the gauge field around it. Here, the gauge symmetry term is also going to be the matter field and the gauge field around it. How many gauge fields are there around it? You can see, see the picture. Uh, this is the picture here. This is the matter field. And on all the little squares, there is a tau. And there are 12 tiles around it. So the gauge symmetry term is the product between 1 sigma z and 12 tau z, 12 of them, sum over the vertex. Finally, we need to add something that looks like a flux term. What is a flux term? Why do we want to add a flux term? A flux term is the minimum pure gauge field term that commute with the gauge symmetry. Right? It's the, the, the term in terms of tau x but still commute with the gauge symmetry. And it turns out just to be a full body tau x term around a cylinder. Uh, I don't know how, let me try to draw it. Let's see if I can draw it. Tau, 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 tau. And another one is tau, 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 x. Sorry, tau x, tau x, tau x, tau x. Mm, what do 
I want to do? Tau x, tau x, tau x, tau x. So four tau x around the side surface of the cube. That one commute with the gauge symmetry and it's a minimum term that we can add for the pure tau x. Oh, yeah, 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 sorry. Mm -hmm. So this is, yeah, that's, that's not helping, sorry. <laughs> uh, um, how do I do it? Ah, okay, maybe I can do this. Um, so this is uh, consider an open cylinder with boundary at the red edges an open cylinder with edge with boundary at the red edges and we have tau x on the side surface of the cylinder Okay, so, so it's side surface of the cylinder, one way, the other way, and the third way. And you put four tau x on the side surface. Okay. All right. And I have one more minute because I'm almost done. So <laughs> this is exactly the x cubed model. Uh, if you get rid of the matter field, just like we did for Toracol, you say that, okay, let's be in the ground state of the sigma z term. So I get rid of the sigma z here. And then this becomes exactly the same as the x cube model that I drew there. If you realize that in three dimension cubic lattice, surfaces are due to edges. Okay. So just, just replace surface by edge you get from one cubic lattice to another cubic lattice. But here, degrees of freedom are on the edges. Here, degrees of freedom are on the surfaces. They're actually the same. It's just drawing the lattice in different ways. And then uh, gauge charge, this is the, the gauge symmetry term. Violating this term gives you the gauge charge. And we know that the gauge charge is a fractal excitation which cannot move because the gauge charge transform under symmetry in all three directions. Right, so it cannot move, it's just pin at the point. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> oh, questions are welcome. <laughs>